uh, I'll, I'll talk to you later. And he just kind of walked in, walked to the other side of this truck. I'm thinking, but your tank is on this side where the hose is. Like, okay, this is awkward. And he's like stood on the other side of the truck and then he clipped and then he like walked around the other side. And I was like, this is a little awkward. But I said, well, I hope you have a great day. He's like, oh yeah, yeah uh-huh, okay. And I could tell that something about the conversation wasn't, maybe wasn't expected. Maybe I caught him off guard. Um, but there's subtle ways we can present the truth out there. But if that's all we're doing is relying on a license plate to be the biggest light for Jesus, I would tell you I'm missing the mark. If I'm just like, you know, I'm just going to pay the extra money to have a custom plate, and that's how I'm going to live for the Lord. That's a great idea. But I would be missing the mark greatly if I just relied on a license plate to spark up some conversation. Jesus says here that our lives are like a city on a hill. I grew up in White Wright, Texas, and I remember one night out, outside of my front porch, and I said, Dad, what's all the orange out there in the distance? He said, son, that's Dallas. I said, what? He goes, well, yeah, you know, Dallas, they've got all the, all the streets are lit up. Every, every yard has its light outside. Every parking lot's lit up. He goes, what you're seeing are all the lights from Dallas, and because there's really, well, there's no lights out here in White Wright, son. That's why you can see Dallas from White Wright, because of all the lights gathered there. And I was like, interesting. And I was like, if you was in doubt, he just stopped me and said, no, you cannot see white right from Dallas. I was like, okay, that makes sense. We as Christians should be like that. When we are gathered together, we should be like Dallas, Texas from White Right, where we are 60 miles apart, but I can see from the horizon that the light that is shining, it is visible. And no one lights a lamp and puts a basket over it to hide it, but they put it on a stand to give light to all in their house. That is who we are supposed to be, which means when our kids sign up for baseball or soccer or whatever it may be, that we as parents, when we take our kids there, we're around other people. We're to be a light, a lamp on a stand to give light so they can see our good works that would glorify our Father in heaven. We're not there to just conceal our faith. We're there to reveal our faith in whatever way possible. Sure, there's subtle ways. Hey, so what do y'all do next weekend? Do do y'all go to church anywhere? That's really fun for me because I'm like, hey, do you go to church? You you should come hear me preach. I'm pretty good. Um, And people, y'all are laughing and y'all heard me. What's funny is I could see why they would laugh when they haven't heard me. It's more hurtful when y'all sings, don't take that and be like, well, that's not as cool as someone else. And I thought that growing up, I would hear these testimonies like, well, I grew up in a drug infested home and my dad did this, and my mom did this, and I actually you know I was addicted to cocaine by the time I was 11, and, and, all, and then God saved me, and here I am preaching. I'm like, I'll never have a great story like that. God can never use me because I don't, I don't have this great, massive thing. It's like, listen, what God has done in your life, those are your stories to share of what God has done, not put a basket over that. Romans 1, 16 through 17, Paul writes and says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, For it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek, for in its righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. I heard a pastor one time at a conference I attended, he said this, many Christians today are not ashamed of the gospel. They are ashamed of themselves because they have not allowed the gospel to change their life. They're not ashamed to say, this is who Jesus is. He loves you enough that he died on the cross. And because he's God, he raised from three days later, and he's powerful enough to forgive you of all your sin. If you'll put your faith, your hope, and your trust in him. Like, they're not ashamed of that message. What most people, are, what he was saying is, are ashamed that that's the message that they believe, but they're not willing to live it out. Because they don't know if it's been really true for their life. I mean, I go to church and I try to make good decisions, but I don't think God has, has control of my life. I don't think I've submitted and surrendered to God like I should or as I once did. When I, I poll people and ask them, what are the top reasons why you don't share your faith? Fear of rejection is one. I'm afraid they're going to say no and walk away. I don't know if I can handle that. The other one is I'm afraid that when I don't witness to my friends, when that specific question comes up, the number one answer comes back is, I'm afraid they're going to look at me and they're going to bring up my life as against me. Oh, so I should be a Christian, but you did this and you said this. Weren't you the one with me last week when we all went and did X, Y, and Z? 
And so I'm ashamed of my own life, maybe not being transferred, tr- uh, transformed by the power of Jesus. And so I'm not ashamed of what Jesus has done. I'm really ashamed that I've not allowed him to really completely do it in my life. 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 9, Paul says, what is it then, what is then Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you have believed and as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither who plants nor waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. We know that it's not our job to save people. As I've said here before, I believe our role is to be like a gardener. I'm not just sitting around looking for the harvest, but I've got to water. I've got to rake. I've got to put seed in the ground. I've got to make sure I keep it free from the bugs that are going to be uh, tearing up the, the plants. I've got to make sure that, that I pull the weeds as they grow so they don't choke out the growth. Like, I have a responsibility. And if all we off area with a bunch of just growth but no fruit producing our job is not to look for just the harvest our job is to water and plant seed that guy the the gas pump i don't know where he'll be this next week i don't know where he'll be 40 years from now i just want to be faithful i could have been like oh it's just a license plate it doesn't really mean it's just a just a thing i could have avoided the opportunity he didn't pray the sinner's prayer he didn't come to church with me this last week unless you're here are you here this weekend I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know the results of that, but what I do want to do is be faithful. And I think so many times we're like, well, if I invite them, they probably won't come to church with me. Is that why you invited them? Just so they'll come to church? Or is it to plant a seed, to demonstrate what's important, to be faithful, to encourage them? We're gardeners. We're not just harvesters. But as a Christian, and in particular as Southern Baptists, we believe we are, have a duty to share our faith with that, within that, it reminds me of the cooperative program. Since we're gardeners and each one has a different role and responsibility, <laughs> our cooperative program is that. Now, some of you know what a cooperative program is because you've been around for the Baptist church for a long time. Some of you have been in a Baptist church and you're like, I still don't know what a cooperative program is. Well, let me tell you, if you Google and go to the, the Southern Baptist website, it says this. The cooperative program is Southern Baptist unified plan of giving through which cooperating Southern Baptist churches give in support of their respective state convention and the Southern Baptist Convention for missions and ministries. It presents a unified and comprehensive budget, throwing a funding blanket over the statewide and national and international missions and ministries. It provides a long-term sustainability for our entities. When a church gives, it provides consistency, consistency and stability. It adheres to our long-term Baptist principle that we can, quote, do more together than alone. And finally, it levels the playing field, making, making a place at the table for every size church. Every church can stand hand in hand and shoulder to shoulder on level ground as partners in the gospel. If we looked at a church that only ran 36 or 40 people on a Sunday morning and said, you have a, a, an obligation to live the gospel out in your community, but also support church planning nationwide and worldwide. By the way, also keep the lights on in your own ministries sustaining as well. The church of size of 36 say, well, we don't know if we can afford to keep missionaries funded throughout the year, our lights on, our ministries going on, and all these other things, but we could do this much. But that's not, a much, that's not enough to, to pay a missionary salary for maybe even a month or maybe not even a month. But then you look at a church that may be running 35,000 people and say, well, look, you can do all this work. And so what we've done together as a cooperative program as working together, standing shoulder to shoulder 
for the mission of, of Christ, locally, statewide, nationally, and internationally. So we cooperate together. There are churches within a 30 mile radius of our church right now that our Blue Bonnet Association, through funds that we give through the Annie Armstrong and through our state convention and through our national convention, have been helped because they had a mass exodus of church members or staff members and the church was, was hurting. And our association was able to step in and help revitalize that church. You may never meet these people in this church. You may never run across them. You may never even get to know who that church is. But we as Bulverde Baptist Church had a, had a role in helping that church stay on its feet to provide them leadership and direction and help the church revitalize their vision for the community and for the gospel because we as Southern Baptists stood shoulder to shoulder and hand in hand to help other people out. It's just not every man for itself. And so that's one thing I love about the cooperative program. And then everyone has a, a, a role and a responsibility. Now within that, sharing the needs or sharing the, our, 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 our testimony with people and being able to do it and equipped by other people not every church has to be able to take, has the opportunity to take mission trips, and so they can partner with the association or the state or the international mission board for that. We as a church are to the point where we're taking four mission trips this summer. One, we're going to Malawi, Africa. That trip is already uh, full, and we can't add any more people to the trip, and it's going to go off, uh, happen sometime in early June. June 5 through 11, we're taking a trip to Rio de Janeiro. Three years ago, Bulverde Baptist Church helped plant a church in Rio. Right now that church is growing and thriving and we're going to be headed there this summer for a thousand dollars if you want to go on the trip. That's all the church is asking you to do is front a thousand dollars and and we will cover the entire rest of the trip and we're going to go partner with this church that we helped start three years ago and we're going to do outreach and evangelism and do some uh, church leadership and some lay training and, and partner with this church to help them continue to be strong and, and reach their community in a, in, a tr in a tremendous way. So if you want to be a part of that after the service, come find me, or you can go to our website under missions, scroll down there, and it'll tell you all the details you need to know. When you're there, you'll also see we're taking two trips at the end of this summer to Brazil to, uh, to, on the Amazon River. We're building two house churches. Again, we may not be the ones who actually share the faith. We're gardeners. And part of this gardening process looks like us building a house church so other ministries and other ministers can come in and set up a church that can only be located to a group of people that can only be asset, accessed by river at certain times of the year. And so we're taking a two crews down there to build two house churches. And so if you want to be a part of that, again, the cost is $1,000. And the church is footing the bill for the entire rest of the ministry. And maybe you're a father and a son, or you, you know, a husband and wife, you're thinking, let's go down there, let's Let's sleep on the Amazon River and let's build a church for people who are going to hear about Jesus for the next 15 years. Because in our gardening part, I wasn't just looking for the harvest. I was pulling weeds or I was watering or I was planting seeds. I played a part in sharing the gospel. And sometimes our part in sharing the gospel looks like building a church for people who can only be reached through river on the Amazon River. Or maybe it's going and helping a church in Brazil to help them, re not revitalize, but continue to help them grow in those areas. Or maybe it looks like you just saying, hey, after the game, I'm providing snacks and you put Bible verses and encouraging me note and all the kids' snack bags. So when they come off the soccer field, they all get something and an encouraging note from you and a direction from scripture. There's always a way that we can share our faith, but we as Christians, we are called to share our faith. The second one is we stand up to dividing issues. I divided these up into two dividing issues. It says racism, greed, and selfishness. These issues are set in our society to rip apart man from one another. The greed or selfishness, this is mine, not yours. Not the together we can do more. Or racism, where because you don't think or act or raised in a place that I was or speak the same language or look the same way, that I'm opposed to you. As Southern Baptists, we say, those dividing issues, we stand up against. As Christians, we need to remember that everyone is made in the image of God. It doesn't matter if they're white, black, brown, whether geological location, geographical location, doesn't matter if they're from China, the Middle East, Germany, Oklahoma, Arkansas, it doesn't matter where they may be from. If they're made in the image of God, if they are a human being, they deserve the opportunity to be loved, by us as Christians, 
and hear the gospel as followers of Jesus. Now, I've overheard conversations at times like, well, those people, man, I tell you what, they, they deserve to go to hell. Can I just tell you something? Every one of us deserve to go to hell. Every one of us. But if it wasn't for the grace of Christ and where we are today and hearing the message and changing our life for Jesus, we deserve hell. Not just those people, whatever those people may be. We, as a church, and as Southern Baptists, we stand against using those types of things. We stand against racism or greed or selfishness based off not willing to share or partner with people because they may look different or may be from a different place. First John 2.11 says, But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Not everyone has to be your best friend, but all people are worthy of love and respect. And we should not be withholding God's blessing or serving people because we are greedy, we are selfish, or because they don't think, act, talk, or look like we. Dividing issues, part B. Sexual morality, homosexuality, pornography are all ways that Satan is trying to divide the family and break up the marriage. I, Paul Brand, I define sexual morality this way. This is my definition. Sexual morality is any sexual act, whether it be physical or mental, that is in a context outside of marriage. It is a act, whether it be thought or in an in, in actual a deed, that is any way that is outside the context of marriage. If you have a thought and it is romantic and it's towards your spouse, that's fine. Read the book of Song, Song of Solomon. But if it is for another person outside the context of marriage, Jesus says if you have a lustful thought, then it's considered adultery. Whether it's thought or physically acted upon, outside the context of what God has defined a marriage, it's sexual morality. What does the Bible say about sexual morality? Ephesians 5.3, and we have this in the NIV because I love how the words that the NIV uses. It says, but among you there should not even be a hint of sexual morality or any kind of impurity or greed because these are improper for God's holy people. How much is a hint? Some people say, pastor, well, how much is a hint? Like, it was like, you know, work with me here. No, here's the thing. We're guilty of this. Even as your pastor, I make mistakes, but what I don't want to do is move the line to make myself feel better. What I want to do is look at the holiness of Christ and say, that's my goal and that's my aim. And when I don't reach that, repentance should be my very next step. But sometimes we would say, well, you know, everyone does it. I wasn't hurting one. No one ever even knows. No one ever saw it. And so we want to move the line to justify what is we're thinking or what we act upon because, well, it didn't hurt anyone and no one really even knows. It was just a, a, a micro moment. It was just a, just a weak moment in my life. No, that's not the reality. We look at the standard and the holiness of Jesus and we say, well, I didn't line up there and I need to repent and I need to confess and I seek forgiveness in that moment. Not move the line, not justify it, not to give any other reasons to give us permission to sin. There should not even be a hint. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a blood, red-blooded man American. You know, surely there's a little bit of grace and ability to locker room talk, you know. No, I'm not gonna rewrite the scripture so we can feel better. We need to look at this and go, this I have failed in, and this is where it is, and confess and repent. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says this, flee from sexual morality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Flee, run, turn away, walk away, abandon, retreat, Jump, skip, hop, roll. I don't care. Go in the other direction. You will never find in Scripture when it talks about sexual sin, Jesus says, stand firm and fight. Resist the devil. No, when it comes to a sexual sin, the Bible says, run, take off, go the other direction. <coughs> Satan has taken a God-given desire, and he has twisted it, and he has perverted it, 
It is something that God has never intended it to be. And when we say, well, you know, I, I, had, this, I had this need, I had this need in my life. I, I just, you know, if I don't do this every so often, or, you know, sex is a need or whatever it is. No, it's not. It's a desire. Food, water, Jesus, those are needs. Sex is a desire. And I've heard good Christian people use the word sex and need in the same sentence. And it's not. It's a desire. And so we need to understand that if we were to pursue Jesus the same way we say we had these needs, you know, we may find later on that we don't really have so much of a need in the first place if we were to pursue Jesus as much as we pursue our own selfish desires. Now, I'm not opposed to a healthy, intimate lifestyle. You see all that through scripture. You see God encourages it. The very first thing after he put man together, man and woman together, he said, be fruitful and multiply. That was the very first thing he told men and women to do once they were together. But to put things where now this has become an issue of dividing within the home or within our marriage, Satan loves that. And the reason why is because we as a people lean towards sexual morality. And we don't lean to trust or patience. We lean to what we want. And we, we grab a hold of anyone who tells us that it's okay. We are, should not have a hint of sexual morality. And when we do, we not only commit our sin against, have a sin against that person, but also against our own body. We should run, turn, flee, jump, whatever we can. When that attention rises, just run. The other thing is you need to be honest about it. You, if, if this is a, a, a sin that besets us, a sin that we struggle with, we should have someone in our life who can hold us up, to hold us accountable, to confess to. And I would go ahead and say I hope you have a healthy enough marriage where you and your spouse can talk about your desires, not necessarily a need. Because if we don't bring our spouse in through our struggles and through our weaknesses, then we're really not two people being one. We're just two people being two. And as Christians, we need to stand up against dividing issues. And sexual morality and pornography and homosexuality, those are any type of sexual actions, whether it be thought or an action that are outside the context of marriage. We as Christians need to take a stance and say, that's sin. And this is what God has designed us to be. That sin, and this is what God's word says, is good and right and holy and walk in that. The third thing is we stand up for the weak. The orphaned, the needy, the abused, the aged, the helpless, the sick, we should speak on behalf of the unborn in the Baptist faith and message. It talks about those things. Proverbs 14, 31 says this, whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. I get it. I've been there. I've been at the stop sign. I've seen the, the 20, 20 or 60 minute report of the person who makes $100,000 a year panhandling on the street. And then we just have this mindset that every person we see that's a beggar or asking for money, that they're just, you know, trying to cheat the system. You know, there's, you know, just get a job. And we've had those things. I've been there. But I don't know that person's heart. I don't know where they're, where they're at. And I don't know their actions. And I don't know those things. So for me to oppress a poor man, I insult his maker. I'm not saying I got it all right and I figured it out. These are some of the things that I personally, I'm at the stoplight that I'm debating and contemplating and I struggle within my own self sometimes. But what is my call as a Christian? What does the word of God tell me to do? What can I do? Do I have a resource? Do I have the opportunity? Do I have the time to go out and buy a, a, a bill at five guys real quick and circle back through and say, hey, here you go and write something on the, on the bag? I, maybe so. But when they stand up for the orphan, the needy, the abused, the aged, the helpless, the sick. James 127 says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, to keep oneself stained from the world. Maybe you want to get involved in our, our foster and adoption ministry. There are people in our church who said, hey, I will be that person that I'll get that phone call at 2 a.m. When, when, a, <laughs> when a tragic situation happens. And kids are ripped from their homes for safety reasons, and they need a place to be. 
I'll be that home for those kids to, to receive the love of Christ. There are people in our church who have signed on to do that, but maybe you're like, I, I can't make that commitment. Okay, don't always look for the harvest. Be a gardener. Maybe you can come along and say, I want to be a resource to those families. I want to be an aid to those families. Because I understand that my Christian duty is to stand up for those people. To be there for the, the widowed or the orphaned. And maybe you're like, you know, every once in a while, I've got a free Saturday. I don't like to brag about it, but I get a free Saturday. I'm willing to help whatever is need. And there are people in our church who need their yard mowed. We've got guys who show up on a weekly basis and go around and, and mow yards for people in our church and in the community who can't do those things. We've got guys who show up in the church every Thursday to help out and do things around the church. And sometimes we take that crew and we go somewhere else to love and serve people in our community. Because it's our Christian duty is to stand up for those. The other thing is Proverbs uh, 31, 8 through 9. In the NIV, it's an instruction from a mother. It says this, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Maybe you want to get involved in our share center. Several weeks ago, we had a fundraiser in our building for our uh, pregnancy care center, the share center here in Bolverde Spring Branch area. Their goal is to raise $160,000 towards their budget, and they reached just under that. But maybe you can come alongside and, and help other people. There are people in our community that had an unexpected pregnancy, and their first thought was maybe to get rid of the child. And they went to the share center, and they had a free pregnancy test, a free sonogram, free evaluations. And many, many, many ladies have chosen to keep their child because they had Christian people say, you know what, not only will we help, help you keep the child, we will walk with you through your pregnancy, and we'll even walk with you through the first several years of this child being born to give you everything from car seats to food to toys to clothing. We'll help you through those times because we value life and we want to speak up for the unborn. And as Christians, this is our duty, but as Baptists, we, we kind of rally, we stand shoulder to shoulder, we link arms with people of like-mindedness and say, this is important to us in the society. So how do we measure up in these three areas? We're sharing our faith, standing up for the dividing issues, or standing up for the weak. Well, for sharing our faith, the easiest ways, the, the two easiest weeks to share, uh, invite someone to church is the next two weeks. We got Easter coming up, Palm Sunday picnic. I mean, Make them a bet. Say, I tell you what, if you come to church, I'll get our pastor to serve chicken to the entire church next week. They don't know. Maybe they do, but maybe they probably don't know we're already going to eat chicken. But use whatever creative tactics you can and say, listen, I love Jesus, and I want you to be around people who love Jesus because I think it will make an impact in your life when you come to church with us next week. We're doing an Easter egg hunt for the kids. It'll be a great time. You ever want to throw an egg at your spouse and say, sorry, it slipped? At church, you can do that next week. Whatever, this is the two easiest weeks to bring people to church. Are, are, are we sharing the things that are important to us? Are we sharing with people how Jesus has impacted us? And come to church is just a step in that. Or standing up against dividing issues or standing up for the weak. See, in this country, we are afforded the privilege of voting. Not every place in this entire world gets a place to where they can vote and they can have their, their voice heard. But in America, we get a chance to say, hey, these are important issues, and I'm at four, I'm against these issues. And you should take opportunity to do that. But let me just tell you something. If all you do is lean somewhere politically and vote when it was time to vote, and that's all you did to exercise your Christian value, we've missed the point. If all we did was say, I voted for this guy or because I didn't want to vote for this guy, and I'm going to talk about everyone else who liked this other guy, then we're missing re the real value in exercising our freedom of religion and exercising the opportunity to tell people about who Jesus is. If all we do is exercise our right to vote and we call it good, we've missed the mark. So as a church, these things are important to us. As Southern Baptists, these things are important to us. We link arms to say, hey, we're, sharing our faith is so important that we want to stand with churches across the entire world to help put a blanket, a funding blanket into every need that every people group, every person who doesn't even have an English a, a translation in their, their Bible yet, that they now can have a, 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 an English, or not an English, a, a Bible in their language and work with those people to do that. That's what we want to do. 
And we partner with the church just all around the world to be able to do that. Because if it was just our job as a church, we, we don't have enough resources to make that happen. But standing up for dividing issues, things that are tearing apart the families, tearing apart marriages, we need to stand against those things and speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. So with that being said, church, let's close in a time of celebration and praising God. So Lord, we, we come before you and we know some of these things we, in our life we, we do well in. And there's some of these things in our life that we, we fail and we're weak in. So Lord, teach us and grow us. Help us to be strong. Thank you for the like-mindedness of the believers here today that we stand shoulder to shoulder with other believers across this entire world making much of you and standing up for things that are right according to the word of God. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for all things. Amen. Church, let's praise him everywhere and anywhere right now. Amen. Church, let's be reminded as we leave today of this great truth. Let's read this together. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Church, who is it that we may encounter this week that God has gone before us that we, we may be able to serve and love and care for them? And invite them back next week as we are ready for encounters with Jesus. We're going to be talking this next week and Easter Sunday, the encounters that people have with Jesus and how it impacted them and changed their life. So church, you are blessed. Be sent into the world to go and make a difference. And if you have any questions and want to pray with us, we're down here at front. Have a blessed and wonderful week.